Uh, really delighted to be having this conversation with you today. Uh, no need to do more of an introduction. The focus of our discussion is going to be around uh, macroeconomic developments, volatility, uh, sort of just a, a holistic view of where the world is headed, the global economy. But before that, I know because you've told me offline, but the reason you're here in Dubai is you are reopening your Dubai offices this afternoon. So very exciting. Tell us what prompted this move. Why is State Street Global Advisors coming back to Dubai? Because this is a reopening, isn't it? That's correct. And I think we've already heard about the exciting developments, the growth, the opportunity that exists here in the DIFC in Dubai in particular. State Street Global Advisors, our parent as well, has been in this region for over 30 years. And our focus has really historically been and continues to be on official institutions from an institutional perspective. But what we see now is the vibrancy of the financial institutions, the intermediary market, the growth and family offices, hedge funds are coming into this market. And as a very significant asset manager on a global basis, we manage index exposures, ETFs. We rank third across both of those areas. Um, active cash management, multi-asset solutions, all of that to us offers a tremendous opportunity to be here. So we're thrilled. We are opening our office officially this afternoon and very excited about that. Yeah, that is exciting. Um, do you see opportunities for growth and expansion outside Dubai and also in other parts of the GCC? We do. Uh, we have offices today in uh, Abu Dhabi and Oman, Riyadh, and we are in effect doubling the number of resources that we have across uh, the region. And what we're seeing is that, you know, because we've been here for such a long time, I think we have a great appreciation for some of the challenges and opportunities and outcomes that investors are seeking. And so as part of that, we are bringing very specialized resources into the region. So portfolio management, OCIO specialists, investment specialists, so that we really are bringing a microcosm of what SSGA has on a global basis into the region. How do you see the investment landscape for ETFs out in this part of the world? We see that as a very interesting development. Uh, obviously, ETFs have had a variety of uses over time, it initially really democratized investing and brought uh, exposure to the equity markets through ETFs. We're seeing the advent of that, especially in the fixed income arena. It's early, very early days in terms of passive fixed income now really taking uh, the front stage, if you will, relative to active. But importantly, we think that the opportunity to create very novel, thematic, interesting indices in concert with other partners to really attract capital into this region in many ways because there's so much excitement as we all know the quality the volume of ipos and companies coming to market mm. there's a lot of opportunities we think on a global basis to really attract a wide breadth of investors into this region. I was region. doing a panel at the same time yesterday with Adina Friedman, the CEO of NASDAQ, and I think at one point she said, I don't know if anyone in the audience was here yesterday, that uh, the, there was more listing activity in Dubai alone than across all of NASDAQ last year. She said it, not me, this is the CEO of NASDAQ. So, you know, the, the, the proof is in the pudding, as they say. Uh, but look, let's turn to the, the macroeconomic outlook. Uh, you talk about fixed income, but we are coming off quite a crucial week, I would say, not just for the US economy, but also for the world as a whole, because everyone around the world is waiting to see what the Fed Central Bank is gonna be doing this year and whether they actually are going to start cutting rates. We've been waiting for this rate cut decision for a very long time. So maybe let me just start off by asking about your interpretation of what we got out of the Fed Chair Jerome Powell last week and whether you think that actually sets the stage for the Fed to start cutting rates later this year. Our view, there were three key um, pieces of information that was really relevant that came out of the press briefings. First and foremost, uh, we do think, the Fed articulated that they believe they have the policy right. We agree. They are focused on either maintaining rates or cutting, but very unlikely to hike rates. Mm. Secondly, uh, Chairman Powell spoke about uh, the quality of 
uh, the labor environment in the U.S. and we think that has very much brought back into view the dual mandate that the Fed has. And then importantly, they talked about uh, reducing the balance sheet and lessening the amount of QT starting in the beginning of June. And we think that sets the stage for easing of monetary policy in the U.S. And as we spoke about yesterday, uh, our belief, which is somewhat out of consensus, is that the Fed should be positioned to start cutting rates as soon as July. And in our view, we think there's room for 75 basis points of cuts. And I think a lot of that has to do with really looking underneath the surface. Overall, we know global growth is slowing. We see disinflationary pressures. You only have to step back a year from today and look at you know, where the primary inflation measure, which is PCE, it was mm. at 4.8% last year. This year at 2.8 percent, we're not quite at that 2 percent yeah. target, but it's very much in view. Yeah. So you've got 75 basis points. There's about 45 priced into the market, so a little bit more than, than, than what the market is pricing in there. Um, but let me just come back to your point about core PCE. It, it is moving in the right direction, but the last couple of months it's sort of stabilized, close to 3 percent. It, it's not continuing to trend, trend downwards. To what extent do you think that we are now just stuck in this stickier inflation environment? A lot of central bankers talk about the final mile against inflation being the hardest. Do you think that there is um, credence to that argument? We don't really see that. And you have to dissect the inputs in terms of inflation, right? We all know that we've seen goods inflation come down. In terms of services inflation, it actually has been quite concentrated. And it reflects what we've seen on the goods side. So the key drivers of services inflation has been shelter, has been uh, auto insurance, and repair services. And so you can see that abating over time. I think the most important area to focus in on is overall labor and wage inflation. And we saw, obviously, the jobs number yeah. was weaker than was expected. Uh, leading up to this point, even the growth in jobs has been quite concentrated across the government and uh, the healthcare services sector. Government numbers came in quite a bit low. We think that that will probably get revised. But the important thing to note is that the Jobs that are being created today are lower quality jobs. These are part-time working jobs. These are, um, you know, uh, really focused on smaller companies, those that employ mm -hmm. one to 10 people, not necessarily the larger companies. The number of job openings have come down. It's on par with what we saw in April of 2020. We are also seeing workers not quitting. Yeah. And it's now at a level akin to what we saw in August of 2020. And so our view is that the trend is very clear, even if the data isn't necessarily showing that through. And so that is leading us to our view that it's important for the Fed to move sooner rather than later. Is this soft landing or hard landing material, what you're describing? You no, know, our overall growth assumptions are not that far off from the IMF. I think the place that we differ the most is in the U.S. Our expectations are for 2% growth versus I think the IMF is at 2.7% growth. So it's still reasonably Decent. robust growth. <laughs> yeah. It just suggests when you look at growth on the one hand, inflation numbers on the other, the policy rate is just too high. Mm. Let's talk about uh, your investment and asset allocation decisions. Given what you've just described, particularly about you know, the state of the U.S. economy, some weakness there, but again, not hard landing grounds. We're not talking about recession in the U.S. How do you position for that environment? So we have different views. Uh, in the short term, we actually think it's a pretty constructive environment, and we are overweight equities, cash, and gold. Uh, I can go into that. I would say longer term, more over the 12 to 24 month period, because of our view on the economy, we would tend towards more quality, mm. both on the equity side as well as fixed income, much more towards governments. If I focus on the near term, even though the U.S. arguably is trading a little bit higher than the mean over time, 
we still see tremendous strength. Obviously, a number of S&P 500 companies have reported, yeah. by and large, they've beat estimates. Mm -hmm. Revisions are still coming in higher, and we think that year over year, we're likely to see a good 10% growth in earnings, and that bodes well. And uh, to a lesser extent, we're still interested in emerging markets just because the overall growth dynamics, the amount of leverage is much more constructive. Uh, cash for obvious reasons, we're being paid to be in cash. And gold is the other place that we are overweight, in part because we think it provides a very interesting hedge to extreme outcomes. And uh, you know, we've seen, obviously, gold perform really quite well um, in these times that we're in. Yeah, yeah. Well, gold is an interesting one. It's, I mean, I, I was actually looking at it this morning. It's up 12% of the year, but a lot of that happened towards the end of February when the market really started pricing in further geopolitical risk premiums. So let me just ask you a question about that, given the region that we're in right now. To what extent, well, well let me just ask you what your level of concern is about the geopolitics of the region and does it affect where you want to put your money? Of course it does. I mean, there are myriad aspects of that question. If I focus specifically on sort of the macroeconomic impacts of geopolitical tensions, you know, the real risk to the market is either supply chain disruptions mm. or energy disruptions. Mm. And so that could introduce uh, some stagflation shocks to the system. Um, and obviously, you know, there are, we get questions a lot in terms of how do investors sort of hedge against a potential scenario like that. And that's where we would say, on balance, uh, there may be an argument to be long energy, to be long gold, um, in terms of equity exposures, to have more of a defensive nature of focusing on sectors like utilities, healthcare, consumer staples. Mm. And then thinking even broadly from a volatility standpoint, clearly today, you know, risk assets are really pricing in a much more benign macroeconomic environment, yet an event that could be quite disruptive would shift that. And thinking about which economies may be more at risk, and so there is an opportunity, US dollar versus euro, sort of thinking about that, going long volatility are ways to sort of hedge a bit yeah. that potentiality. Yeah. I, I, I am interested in just your, you know, your composition of equities, cash, and gold, because it seems to be somewhat of a barbell approach. You've got you know, the high risk, you've got the very safe, the cash, and then you've got the, uh, they say pave in the hedge, yeah, the gold. Um, but when it comes to cash, because interest rates are so high, I get the premise of why you'd want to put your money in cash and get that interest rates, those interest rates uh, for, on, you know, on, on, on just deposits. But if the Fed do start cutting interest rates, would you be incentivized to reduce your holding of cash and actually start deploying it? We would be. And that's why when I talked about the longer term horizon, even not that long term, but medium horizon, we would be shifting into uh, you know, higher quality fixed income yeah. because that we expect that to be uh, uh, an attractive place to be. But at the same time, you know, the markets are reasonably priced. And so uh, not only are you getting yield in cash, but it also provides an opportunity to deploy more into the market mm -hmm. should opportunities arise. Right. So when you say medium term, that gets us through this November. There's a certain election coming up <laughs> in the US. Uh, how do you think a change of presidency, a, a return of President Trump, would also affect your investment horizon? Yeah, we, again, we've thought about this uh, question more from a macroeconomic standpoint, less about um, you know, some other factors. So the question is really status quo versus a Trump presidency. We think that the Senate is leaning more towards Republicans, House leaning more Democrat, although we could see a potential sweep should Trump uh, um, win the overall election. If it remains the status quo, we think it's very much a constant debate, discussion around the debt ceiling. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, you know, there may be a greater focus around discretionary spending, defense spending, but the uh, fiscal stimulus that we've seen under this current administration, we think is gonna be lessened as we go forward. If we shift then 
to a Trump presidency. I think the three key differences that are likely to play out is around immigration, industrial policy, and trade. Mm -hmm. And so we know that Trump was very much uh, you know, a proponent of limiting immigration under the pri Biden presidency. Uh, those measures have continued, but we've seen even in 2023 alone, two million workers coming into the U.S. economy. Now that has helped uh, abate sort of the labor inflationary pressures, but also introduced probably some level of services, goods uh, demand. Um, the second area is obviously trade. Uh, you know, Trump has been uh, very vocal about uh, wanting to introduce tariffs, whether that's tariffs coming in from China or just broadly, just tariffs in general. We think both of these have impacts in terms of growth and have inflationary pressures. And then there's the industrial policy, because a hallmark of uh, the current administration has been fiscal stimulus focused around the renewable sector as well as in the semiconductor sector. And we think on balance, a lot of the Republican-led states have benefited from these policies, so we doubt that there's really gonna be that much change in terms of the overall contours. Mm -hmm. But there may be a greater emphasis on fossil fuels. And so I think it's really this question of what is the impact on interest rates, on inflation. But it's one of the first times that we've seen not that much difference as we look forward, uh, you know, on who ends up in office as we've maybe have seen in prior elections. Mm. I would just say, you know, going back to 2017, and I work in the news, every morning we would come in and there'd be a new tweet out about tariffs on some other nation, and that sort of drove the agenda for the day. So I, I wonder to what extent markets and investors are being complacent about this just question mark premium about what a potential Trump administration could do and what they have in mind, because it's, it's difficult to know beforehand and probably they don't know because oftentimes he would make decisions on the spot. There's that uncertainty premium that goes along with that presidency, that type of presidency. I think there. that's right. You know, I think when President Trump first came into office, he had written a number of executive actions. And I think a lot will depend on whether he has a split Congress or if it's, um, yeah. you know, single party. I yeah. think it'll be more easy, obviously, for him to enact things that he wants to get done. And a big question is we have, you know, the tax cuts, they're gonna come to an end mm -hmm. in the next couple years under the next administration. It'll be easier to continue those if uh, the Republicans um, have the majority in both parts of Congress little less so, I think, if it ends up being split. Mm. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. I want to ask you a question that sort of ties in some of the geopolitics of the region and the world with the U.S. dollar, because, um, you know, in the past few years, there has been a movement from other parts of the world to reduce their dependency on the U.S. dollar, be it by signing trade deals and other currencies, um, joining blocks, you know, BRICS, there was talk about issuing a currency that is separate from the USD for trading purposes. What is your view of the US dollar over the medium term? I'm not talking about the next couple of months, but just over the medium term, do you think that its dominance is gonna to start to subside? We don't really see that today. I think from a valuation basis, obviously the US dollar is reasonably strong. And if we're correct in terms of the Fed beginning to cut, we think that there's room for the dollar to declined by 10, 15%. It's really a question of less whether the dollar has its dominance, but just at what price. And I think that is our focus in the sort of medium term. Mm. Final question then, we spoke mainly about the US, but are there any other global markets that are on your agenda, on your horizon right now? Yeah, so we've been focusing obviously on the developed markets. We do see this rate cutting regime coming into play. And uh, we actually think that the EU will be the first to cut. We think that time frame is June. If you look at Germany and France, their inflation rates are at 2.2%, so it's really timely to be followed by the US, Canada, the UK. 
and then we would expect Japan to increase rates, something like 15 basis points, probably before the end of the year. Mm, yeah, Bank of Japan, always the last one to act. Well, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the discussion. That was Ye Shin Hong, the uh, president and CEO of State Street Global Advisors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.